How's everyone doing? Uh, this is amazing. I was kind of only expecting like my mom to be here. Uh, so yeah. it's great to see we have such a full crowd. Uh, today we are going to be learning about creating video on a budget for your business and how that can be a very useful tool of communication. Um, so first, my name is Tony Calvis. I am a video producer at Nextiva, one of our video producers at Nextiva. Uh, and we have a spectacular cast of panelists. Uh, so why don't we start off with Ryan, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Hi, I'm Ryan. I have a music company based in Portland, Oregon called Marmoset. We provide music for uh, videos, uh, commercials, film, and TV, and um, uh, basically all that kind of uh, ideas and possibilities we'll be talking about today are probably opportunities uh, that there may or may not be music, and we are the type of people that provide music, so that's what we do. Hello, uh, I'm Chris Levine. Uh, I make videos for a company called Wistia in Cambridge, uh, the Boston one. Um, Wistia is a video hosting platform for businesses, uh, and I'm excited to be here. I'm Max, I am also a video producer at Nextiva with Tony, um, and we put together, the two of us put together all the videos for this event, along with all of Nextiva's commercials, testimonials, we do event videos, and then uh, we stress a lot uh, um, to do internal video as well, so I definitely want to talk about that, it's a big deal. Uh, hello, my name is Christian. I have a creative studio slash agency uh, in Montreal, Canada. Uh, Atelier Transfer is the name. Uh, I started with web videos uh, at the dawn of podcasting, and since then I've been uh, helping companies gain outreach and uh, <clears throat> explain what they do. And uh, yeah. Okay, so just for our panelists to get some sense of who's in the audience, how many of you guys are currently using video in your business? Wow, Oof. that is a lot yeah. I was expecting. Okay. Well done. We're going to get more hands by the end of, this. of surprises. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so then we can assume that uh, a lot of people are familiar with that and you're maybe just here to learn more about how to uh, engage with the customer a little bit better. Um, we have plenty of questions that are going to cover that. Uh, so, I guess uh, for the schedule of today, uh, I would like to go into some pretty good questions that we'll have discussions about. Then we'll move on to a lightning round where I'm going to spit out questions as fast as I can. These guys are going to try and give me the fastest answer possible. And once I've decided that they've answered it, they're going to ring this bell right here and we can move on to the next question. Uh, and then lastly, we'll follow up with Q&A. So we, uh, we're the last session in here, so we are totally open for staying as late as you guys want. Just keep those questions coming. We'd be happy to answer them. And if you see us in the conference, grab any one of us. We're all film, audio geeks, and we will be happily talk your ears off. So first question, uh, just to get started, uh, why would a company that does not incorporate video take its first steps towards adopting video as a frequent communication tool? Mm. Go. Well, I think, I think Gopi did a great job today talking about the importance of using video in your business. I mean, just, you know, you don't have to have a huge set of gear to be able to make something that gets millions of views and just <clears throat> skyrockets you and your business. I mean, it's, I wouldn't say it's necessarily easy, but it is possible. You just have to be smart about it. Yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you why we do it at Marmoset. We, um, clearly, we live in a digital world where there's a lot of digital uh, communications and experiences happening every day. And if, if you're not careful, it can be a cold experience. And so we're constantly trying to, trying to figure out how do we bridge that gap. We're in Portland, Oregon, so we're probably not, most of our customers and clients and relationships are not in Portland, Oregon. And Portland's kind of an island, upper left corner of the United States. And so we're constantly thinking about how do we get off the island and how do we get uh, real human relationships mm -hmm. Um, and interactions with our clients. And so as we're creating content, we're constantly thinking like, how can we put our people that actually work with clients, how do we put them on, on picture and make them relatable, approachable, not sound, uh, and not come off as like uh, elitist or nuanced or necessarily too expert, but really just approachable um, and understandable. And so we're constantly trying to breach that um, as everything's going digital, let's go analog and let's go relationship and human and see if we can connect um, to their hearts and minds a little bit. 
I like that word you use, approachable. Um, you know, that, that's really important with video. You want to make it feel like these people can just reach out to you. Uh, one example that Nextiva goes through is that we'll have, uh, you know, we'll have videos that people will see of our employees and then they'll meet those employees and they'll say, oh yeah, you're, you know, you're well from all of our, all the uh, culture videos or whatever. Uh, and Wistia, you know, or uh, Chris, I know you guys uh, do that at well, Wistia. They, they wrote the book on this, so. Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, to, to respond to your, their question about getting started with video, um, I think to piggyback off of what Ryan said, video is the most emotional medium that we have. Uh, and the, the secret weapon of video is that it can scale interaction. Um, and so, like, one way to kind of convince somebody to get started with using video, if you haven't already, um, would be to try to make video or use video to scale an interaction from maybe a support angle of your, of your company. Um, maybe you're answering a frequently asked question all the time or um, you have like a tricky workflow that you have to explain over and over again. That is where video is amazing because it's great at explaining complex uh, topics. Um, coupled with the fact that you can inject that human element and like make an emotional connection with the viewer, that's a slam dunk. And going along with the human element, one thing that yeah. we do at Nextiva that beforehand we hadn't ever seen any other company do is uh, with social media replies uh, to our um, you know, Facebook or Twitter pages, uh, usually uh, people would say, hey, you know, I had a great experience with John today, and uh, you know, thank you so much for solving my issue. And then we'll f have somebody actually get on camera and in 15 seconds have a face-to-face -face interaction with them and say and, and talk to them by name, you know, like, you know, hey, Patty, thank you so much for reaching out to us today. Uh, happy to hear that John was able to solve your problem. If you ever need anything from us, please feel free to let us know. And just that like, little 15 second snippet is gonna keep them not only a customer, but an advocate of your company because of that. Yeah, I would second what Chris said. Um, if you're starting out and you haven't even launched yet, like I've I've worked with companies that are at the very early stage. They're still looking for, for funding even. They haven't launched. Uh, you can use video to clearly explain what it is that you do. You don't necessarily have to adopt it as a frequent means of communication. Just think about using it to do one thing. Uh, you can use it to replace um, like a lengthy uh, manual to do like a short tutorial. Um, you can try to get behind, rather than show what it is your product does, you can try to get behind the idea of it. And, and there, like when you're at trade shows or when you're meeting with people, they're immediately on the same page. So video can be great for that because of what you said as well, the emotional connection. And yeah, well, a lot of that emotion comes from culture as well, the culture of the company bleeding into the video aspects and the videos that they promote out to their customers or the public. Uh, now, each one of the companies you see up here has incredible company culture, and you can see these personalities through their work. I mean, it's just obvious. And one of my next question uh, that I want to talk about is, you know, what would be kind of an interesting, an easy way for people to get into it where, like, what kind of videos? And I think culture videos are very easy ones to get on because they don't need to be high production. They're, ver they're very good at communicating a general idea that many people can get behind. Uh, so maybe if each of you can talk about how culture plays a part in your video and how that might be an easy transition for younger businesses. Huh. I think, I think Whiskey should do this one first. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so actually, um, a lot of the stuff that we do at Wistia started with a, a culture video, and it wasn't low production, but um, it was basically a video that um, I made the first time I ever met the guys at Wistia. Um, I went up because of a friend uh, introduced me to the company, um, just shot some kind of B-roll footage, just kind of environmental vibey footage of 
the small burgeoning startup company, uh, kind of doing their thing in their office, working, laughing together, um, you know, having coffee together. Uh, and we cut that to about a 45 second video, um, which really didn't have much substance at all. Uh, it was just kind of like a behind the scenes, like, oh, this is what this company looks like, this is their office, these are the people that work there. And we put that out, um, Wistia put it out on their blog, and then all of a sudden they started, like people, people loved that because it kind of pulled back the curtain on the company, and we, like, people realized that, hey, like Wistia is made up of real live human beings, just like me. This is cool, now I know a little bit about them. So that kind of exploded a lot of our live action uh, video. Um, for me, my, my piece on culture videos being an awesome way to start making video, um, you might think of a culture video as maybe something like a recruiting video or maybe you're capturing an interesting piece of your company's history like you guys are going on an all hands uh, meeting uh, off site or uh, you're having you know, you know, a birthday party or something in the office. So a lot of the things that we do at Wistia with culture videos is we'll make these tiny, we call them video snacks, which are almost like nostalgic mementos of a point in time in our company. And some of these videos won't even be shared externally. They'll just be like for our own personal use uh, to like kind of motivate and inspire and excite people internally. And so because of that, it's like such a low risk way you can make a culture video. It could be like not even very good outside of your company, but you don't even need to share it with somebody outside your company. You can keep it internal. And it's a great way to just start making video. It's an excuse to make video. It's an excuse to shoot and edit and put it together, even if it never sees the light of day outside of your company. Yeah, yeah and to add to this point, uh, this isn't just for smaller internet-based companies. I mean, companies like Nike are doing this. Com companies like Nike will film some race that happened, and they'll cut together this amazing recap of it, and it will only play for the next board meeting. And then it's gone. You know, it's in the archive. So, you know, I, I love the scalability of culture as well, where they're going to put tons of manpower and production into a video that's going to be played once, and that's its shelf life. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, you know, our culture for smaller companies uh, is really to engage with, uh, engage the employees, but also with customers and all that. And one thing we do at ne uh, Nextiva for the past, I think it's been over three years, almost four years now, we do something called Next TV, uh, where every Friday, uh, no matter what, we do a, uh, a news show, basically. And it started out as just a, a one or two people in front of a laptop just reading the morning announcements, basically. And at that time, we probably had 150 employees. And as it's grown, um, you know, kind of the standards have also come up with it. And so the engagement, we noticed actually through using Wistia, we've noticed that the engagement of those videos was actually just going down as the video went. So uh, my boss was like, we need to, how do we get people to continue watching the news? I mean, what are we gonna do? And what we decided was we're gonna give somebody a microphone, wireless microphone, and we're just gonna connect it to a little DSLR, and we're gonna run around the office and ask people who know the answers directly instead of just having it third party where like it's on a piece of paper and there's no heart into it. And it just skyrocketed. I mean, er, like all of our uh, analytics were just like straight line, like nobody was leaving. Um, and it was imp really impressive. And then so as we've gone, we've just continued to step it up. And now we incorporate skits. Uh, just last week we did the mannequin challenge. You know, we kind of like, try to keep it going, uh, you know, with the trends, but then sometimes, if it's good enough, uh, we'll even post it on our public channels as well. Um, not the whole episode, but just like the little skits. So it's not only entertaining for the people internal, but it's also great to show company culture externally as well. Could, could I ask a question on that? Yeah. Like, how do you actually stay motivated to be making weekly content? Because something like that, it's gotta be super taxing, yeah. you know? Oh, God, it's Friday, people are expecting That this. happens, no, it does actually, I mean, and um, it's, it's really just, you know, like when you, you cross one off the week and then you go to the next week and you go to the next week and you're looking at this whole calendar, you're like, dang, I got like three years under my belt without missing one. Well, holidays we don't do, but yeah. um, 
and at that point, it's just like it's riding on you. Everyone's expecting it, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's 500 people that want to watch Next TV, and you're the guy that does it. It's all, and if people are going to come up to you, I, I can't, I just, like, my worst nightmare is, be, like, somebody saying, where's Next TV at? And I don't have one. Um, so, and it's really, and I, I have a really a good time doing it. And besides showing people internal culture, it's, it's really good for larger companies or even smaller companies to get to know the people within their company, because mm -hmm. Nextiva, we just recently started uh, going onto different floors. So we are, we're all in one building uh, at the Scottsdale location here. And as we've grown, we've taken over new floors. And as that's happened, the challenge has been how do we continue to unify the company uh, culture internally? And Nextiva has been that answer. So we go around and we talk to people who normally people would not have seen or ever talked to uh, before, but now they know who they are, they've seen their face, they know that they've got something in common, and then now they can say, hey, you know, I saw you on the news today, that was awesome, I'm, you know, I'm Max, and then now, they're, now they know each other. Mm. And it's an awesome way, especially if you're having, like, you know, new hires coming in every now and then, uh, put them on Next TV, and then they're not new anymore. So, yeah. Well, speaking of new hires, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is this trend of hiring in-house video producers, video producers and music producers. Uh, this is starting to gain a lot of popularity of having internal people that perhaps know the company best, know the culture best, know the product best, know the work that went into it. Uh, what are some benefits and do you see this trend continuing uh, into you know having more production done in house. Uh, don't all jump at once. Oh, oh well, you're you're an example of this, right? Uh, yeah. So Max and I and Chris and uh, soon to be uh, Ryan, uh, we all have are either have or are getting uh, in house video producers. Uh, so like Max was saying, we He's do the news every week. Uh, Chris and his team do oh. plenty of culture videos. They do all the commercials. Uh, they do product launches, a lot of things. Marmoset has great internal uh, culture, and their videos really show the heart of who they are. I mean, you really feel like you get to know them just from watching the first video on their web page. You know, so I mean, I'd love to get your guys' thoughts. On right, I, I would agree. So you, this kind of touches on the previous question, where you guys <clears throat> talked about different examples of. Yeah, they can show your process. If people have companies that can, either their process or their their culture or their vision, uh, that works really well. If it can, uh, if you have definitely, if there's something unique for sure, that's something that you can put forward. Um, there's great examples of those cult culture vi culture videos, um, and the great ones are so good because they're so authentic and so real, um, so you totally get the company. If um, you want to be doing that in a way that, uh, you know, you can't fake that. So when, when that comes across, you're really, yeah, showing behind the scenes. For internal uh, versus outsourcing, I, I mean, the important thing is, is to matter, to, to whatever you're putting out for video to make a connection, uh, to make a real difference. Those kinds of videos really give your company a voice. If you guys didn't notice, all the buzzwords were in his statement. Authenticity, <laughs> making a connection, he's got them all. Sorry to cut you off, Max. Did he say story? A story, <laughs> yeah. There you go, story, yeah. Too. I think uh, it, from the in-house to hiring out, I, th I think it depends on how much you're willing to really dedicate to using video on a constant basis. Um, you know, with Nextiva, Tony and I live and breathe video every single day, and I know that Chris does at Wistia as well, um, and it's, it only makes sense from that perspective to have an in-house video production team. But at the same rate, if you're going to be doing bigger projects, you're going to want bet more help. So it could be led, I'm speaking from Nextiva's point of view, but we lead a team to for larger projects. Um, but for all the other things that we can do in-house, we just do it on our own. And so I think it depends on the project. I think it depends on the company. So I don't know if you guys have anything else to add on that. Yeah, I'd say 
we're, we're kind of classic, you're always your own worst client. And so, um, and also the nature of our business being a music company that puts music in picture and in video, um, we've, we've kind of been resting on our laurels a little bit, I'm afraid to admit, where we've, there's tens of thousands of, of videos that we have our music in that we can kind of repurpose as content for our audience. And, um, and then occasionally we've hired um, uh, uh, free, freelance producers um, and, and content producers to create stuff for us or partner with people. Um, but we're, fi we're finally doing it. So like, I, I'm literally hiring somebody this week uh, who's going to be a uh, staff uh, video producer, um, a content producer, to basically do um, what th this thing we're talking about. We've reached that tipping point where 40 employees, where it's time I, I, can, I can put it off no longer. And basically, I'm going to hand them the Wistia playbook and say, do what they're doing, and, 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 and basically drink the Wistia Kool-Aid, because I think you do it so well. Check out the videos, seriously. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, if you don't know what you're doing, <laughs> Drink it. Like, like, th they'll help you. Um, yeah, so I have lots of, lots of feelings about in-house video. Um, I think the trend is 100% moving towards hiring people in-house. It's going to go the same way that um, design went for um, a lot of uh, businesses. Tons of, uh, especially if you're in, in software, uh, but I don't care what kind of business you are, uh, you're using design. A lot of people are going to start using video in-house as well. Um, I would offer some advice. Uh, the way that I developed my relationship with Wistia, I started with that one video that I made kind of on spec, just for free, just for fun. They were sold on it. And instead of, um, Basically, what makes an in-house video person so powerful for a company is the opportunity to make videos that don't work, to fail, actually. If you're hiring somebody, you're spending a ton of money on a freelancer, if they don't make a good video, your money is, is blown. But if you're working with um, somebody that is starting in-house, what happened, what attracted me to Wistia was I actually started as a retainer. So I was like, I was paid for five days a month to come into the office and do whatever. Like, it might, might have been some inbound marketing stuff, might have been a product video, but then there was some other downtime to just be like, all right, let's try something. Then that turned into 10 days a month. Then I drank the Kool-Aid and fell in love with the company and went full time. But I would say that as like a, you know, as one way that you guys could start um, getting bought into using video, try to find somebody, maybe like a wedding video producer, maybe um, put out a, like, find somebody that was just out of film school to see what a five days or a couple days a month in the office mm -hmm. can do for the types of videos right. you're making. And to write off that, um, hiring an internal video uh, producer is amazing because they know your company culture better than anybody. And you don't have to explain it to them. They just get it right mm -hmm. away. Yeah. And they know everybody in your office. So the yeah. people that you're filming are comfortable already versus hiring somebody that they've never met before. And then they shine lights in their face. And then they're like, go. And it's just like, it, it's, it doesn't work. And you can tell on camera. And so if I'm filming somebody and I know that I need to get somebody who's in development, um, a lot of the development people don't necessarily like to be on camera. So I know who to go to and how to ask them, and it just makes the overall product so much better in the end. But I do think that there is opportunities to work with agencies and like creative professionals too. Just because you have somebody in-house doesn't mean you should totally be like, all right, well, this is, I'm gonna make, you know, this is, I'm, I'm capped at this, this video team. You can, if the, if the project presents itself, still seek professional help. Uh, seek professional. <laughs> seek, seek the help of a video professional to. Uh, <laughs> wow, there are parallels there. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. We're all on the couch right now. Um, but yeah, I don't think you should be limited just because you have somebody in house from still farming out some some work for some more advanced videos that you might be making. Yeah, and one thing I would like to point out about all our panelists, including myself, is that you know we're video and music guys, and we are so passionate about this stuff. You know, you ask us to get a video, we'll, we'll, we'll make something, we're proud of it, show it to you, tell us it's garbage, we'll say no problem, pull over time, we'll do it, you know, and uh, we'll try a million ideas just to make sure that we're getting the right communication. I mean, it's for the art. I mean, every single one of us up here are artists. We feel this emotional attachment to our craft. Uh, so hiring in-house video often gets you way more effort out of that transaction than hiring an agency that's going to outline exactly what they're going to give you. And once they deliver that final product, no changes, no nothing, 
goodbye, hope to do business with you again. So, you know, I think that that's a really important element is that, you know, us, we're, I mean, we've all worked the late nights because we really want to make great content for our companies. It's not just for the paycheck, you know, like you're, you're doing it because you genuinely have a connection to that company. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, those late nights mean a lot more when you know that the company that you're working with and for is something that you can stand behind 100%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So the next thing I want to go on to is uh, be the unsung hero of video and music, which is data. And we touched on it briefly with uh, Nick Stevens' use of data, but I would love to hear some of the use of how you've used data to craft videos, how you've used data to perhaps shift mm. where those videos are going, who they're being seen by, uh, because that drives a lot of the decision making when creating videos. Who do we got? Mr. Analytics. Me? I'm Mr. No, Analytics? Brendan. Brendan's Mr. Analytics. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, to be honest, I think data um, justifies our existence as an in-house video person to an extent. Um, it also uh, gives us an opportunity to improve when we know how our video is actually being uh, consumed. So as opposed to just um, seeing, okay, wow, my video got like a thousand plays. That means I'm like king of the world. I'm making the greatest video in the world. But if only, you know, if a thousand people watch your video and they only watch like maybe the first 15 seconds, there's, there's so much room to improve there. So like Max was saying with uh, engagement, as a video producer, I am like glued to the video engagement. I want to make sure that I'm retaining my audience's uh, attention um, and respecting viewers' attention. This works. This, this applies even for internal videos too. I want to make sure that, and external, yep. um, and you know, data helps you make better decisions with the next video you're going to make. Right. And so like with, with the analytics and video, I don't, I mean, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with how kind of the, the heat maps kind of work. A lot of different providers kind of use it, but from our experience, and I'm not just saying this because two of the WISTI guys are here, but the, so these two WISTI guys are here because their product is so amazing and we started using it years ago and we started developing the relationship with them because of the product. And it's, you're able to see where people are tuning out and how many people are coming back to certain spots because maybe it might not be clear. Maybe it's an instructional video and it, like, people are coming back to this certain spot because, hey, it's really confusing. So maybe you just do your own video specifically on that one spot and then you link it within that video to go into more depth on it. It's, there's so many different things that you can get out of using analytics for your videos. Um, just yeah, do, you guys look at, do you guys use data very much with your video process? Um, not, not as in-depth as y'all do, by any means, because uh, we're, not, we're not typically the, the video creators, yep. um, but we're looking at music that way. We're looking at how long somebody's you know, listening to a song um, in the more traditional sense. Um, but not as video, fo not as video focused. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Well, I think another unsung hero of video is music. I think most people, especially if they haven't ever really produced a video or they're just getting started, they underestimate the power of what music can do for your video. Using the right track, and I'll let you kind of finish this off, but, but using the right track can completely change the tone and the effectiveness of your of your video. Yeah, I mean it's. It, it's, it, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. I, I think is if you can identify your objective um, first, it helps make the music decisions um, much, much, much easier. Um, if you don't know what your objective is relative to music, then it's really hard to figure out what you want to do with the music. Um, so I don't, I don't know if, that, if that's helpful, but um, uh, you know, we provide a lot of tools to help people um, approach music that way. Um, so tip, typically, we, we, we want to be in, um, in, the, in the filmmaker or the editor's head and thinking about how are they going to approach music, um, when are they going to think about it in the filmmaking process, and what are they going to want out of that experience. Um, but, but, but really, I mean, I think you that, you that use music and make the videos are probably the best, the best to speak to, to that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, like, if you were to put an overarching goal of a video, if you were to say what that goal would be, usually it's make somebody feel something. Mm -hmm. I want my audience to feel something 
after they watch this video. Maybe I want them to feel empowered to do something else. Maybe I want them to feel happy that they're like a customer, whatever. Like that's what video is great at. And like I like we, feels, yeah. Marmoset um, Music, especially kind of like in, in their program, um, lets the editor and the video producer kind of align the video goal with the feels that you want people to feel. Right. Yeah. So so I mean, it's very important uh, w to identify the uh, the feels that you want. So emotions, um, whether it's a character or a story um, uh, that, that you're that you're approaching it from. Um, I think identifying what, what you want those feels to be, what you want those emotions to be, is going to be really important. Um, we have some exercises that we encourage people to take, you know, where you, you basically like write down, um, you know, the five or ten emotions that, that you think are going to be most important to your video to, to get the, um, the, the impact that you want, and then narrow that list down to maybe two or three, and then really focus on finding music that hits, hits the mark on those emotions. Really, really important. Also knowing the arc that you're going to edit to. Uh, for your story? Are you going to start real big out of the gate and then uh, gradually kind of end on a more quiet um, or subtle moment mm -hmm. at the end? Or are you going to do the opposite where you start off really, really quiet and subtle and then ramp up to some big, big feels and big emotions at the end? That's really important relative to music and music drives a lot of that, sometimes as much as the edit itself does. And so figuring out what kind of emotions and approach you want from the arc of your piece and the emotions and then figuring out if you want to go, go really deep, figuring out what kind of instruments um, you believe in a song or what kind of genre or style of a song are going to hit on the emotions that you want to achieve in your piece or in your story um, are really important. And there's many different um, aspects from, from tempo or energy to the arc to the emotions to uh, the style or genre. You can get into specific instruments that can all basically focus in on what is that emotional impact you want from your, from your, uh, from your piece. And one thing to consider when approaching that idea is, uh, I, I don't know if you guys in film school were taught uh, uh, your audience is half blind and half deaf and you're looking for a good rating. Oh. Yeah. So, you know, if you want that five star rating for whatever video you're making, you have to consider that, you know, the music is going to get you halfway there. Video can only do so much. It, it truly is an art form that is going to incorporate a lot of different sensor, uh, senses from the viewer, and if you leave one out, they'll be, they'll be left wanting. Yeah. But uh, so we've kind of touched about, uh, talked about uh, how the technology has changed vi uh, video creation and how we have data now and how we're learning more about how people watch video. How have your guys' own approaches to filmmaking, video, music creation, how have those changed with the technology? Because we were all around before, the, before Google was a thing, and you know, we saw that transition. And you know, I, I even, a lot of us came from when film was still around. You know, and we saw the transition to digital. And we saw the transition to understanding all the data behind viewership. So I'd love to know how each of you have changed your approaches or your views of film and audio based on those, based on the past 10 years. I think Christian, you've got a very unique plan, for, like plan of action for your videos because you're not really, you're kind of traditional, like, and you, and you, even in a modern age. Well, yeah, I mean, maybe to add a bit to the analytics thing, if, if we're talking YouTube Vimeo, um, I would, also consider taking analytics with a grain of salt because if it were all reduced to a, f a formula, like we'd all be applying it and our jobs would be super easy. So when we were talking about emotions and feelings and um, yeah, they don't necessarily tell you everything, like sure, the amount of views, but how many of those views uh, might have been negative impacts. So, you know, giving, not necessarily creating a good experience for someone. Um, yeah, te technology, sure, as well. I mean, that's one, one part of it. Uh, also, I would say, think about the support this is going on, because that's, that's the thing that has influenced me the most as a web video producer. Uh, I got started on the first video-enabled iPod <laughs> with the click wheel, tiny screen. 
so that definitely influenced how things were cropped, uh, how it looked, the pacing of it. Um, so yeah, the way it's broadcast. Today, it's majority, it's on mobile. And the effect of that is that the attention span has gone way down. So you're asking a lot of, of someone to, to, to watch a video. So you want to make sure that it's, uh, it's going to engage them. So for me, the attention span for sure has, uh, the, the medium itself has, that plays the biggest role in, in how it's delivered. Ryan, do you want to take this? Well, I, I mean, relative to the technology, I'm just fascinated by, by the growth of, of video use. Um, and I mean, there, there's more, there are more videos being made today um, than the history of humankind. And, and it's growing, I don't know if it's exponentially, um, but it's growing at such a rapid pace um, that it's, it's really fascinating to me. Um, I really enjoy it because it's more opportunity for us to have, have music involved um, in film. Um, but, but I'm also really fascinated by how um, hyper um, niche everything is becoming uh, from a demographic standpoint. Um, I'm not aware of too many companies that are just making general brand videos anymore. Um, I don't know how effective those are anymore. I, in fact, I, would, I, I think it's pretty safe to say they're not effective. Um, you need to really be, be focusing on, on very specific people, very specific individuals. Um, and, and with technology and the data we have and all the various channels we have for distribution, you can actually do that. And so watching that grow and watching that open up and, and at the, the, the insane pace it's happening um, is really fascinating to me and it's something I'm, I'm really holding on loosely but, but watching with, um, uh, with, with a ton of anticipation. I'm, I'm sure you all are in a similar boat. I yeah, I mean, for me, the technology piece and how it's affected video is, I, I think it sums up by saying, basically technology with video advancements uh, have allowed, have put in, put, in the, to put the tools in people's hands, and as a result, we've seen an explosion of creativity. Yeah. Like, we've always been, we've always had a lot of creative people, but up until recently, you had to have a very expensive camera in order to express that creativity. And now, everybody in this room is armed with tools, whether it's the webcam on your laptop, or it's the HD, possibly 4K, uh, camera in your pocket that's your phone. Um, and then you, that can also get applied to the whole DSLR revolution uh, where back in the day, back in the video day, talking 2000, if you wanted to shoot 24 frames per second and interchange and put a different lens in front of the video camera, you had to drop like 40 grand. Come on, that's ridiculous. You can, you can get a DSLR right now for like 500 bucks and be, so like we're seeing an explosion of incredibly creative content and that is thanks to like the crazy amount of technological advancements brought to the video industry. Right, and it's not just the, the hardware but the software. Facebook Live and Snapchat and all these other live streaming apps are huge right now. I mean, I'm sure everyone here has either heard or seen of the Chewbacca lady <laughs> where she was in her car and like she, she's a, like, she is like a millionaire now. She's definitely a millionaire. I mean, that, uh, she helped Cole sell that thing out like, I mean, for like months after that. <laughs> um, but you know, you have access to this, like this machine that's in your pocket that is able to get your face in front of the entire world. And everybody's, everybody's searching on their phones for Chewbacca Lady. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, look it up. Yeah. yeah can we pull up Chewbacca Lady? Yeah. <laughs> Is that possible? Do we have that technology? Yeah. Don't but it. it's true. You know, um, Facebook Live and Snapchat, I mean, it, at the same rate, um, you know, with Snapchat especially, your audience is going to be a little different. So you need to know, if you're going to be using it to apply to your brand, you need to be not only making videos that your your, uh, that market will enjoy, but you have to do it in a way that that specific medium is meant to be used. You cannot be making full feature movies, well, actually, I think you probably could now, but people <laughs> probably have, with, with Snapchat. Um, but, you know, you can, you, can, you just have to know how to use each medium in the correct way in order to make it the, the most effective uh, use of it as possible, so. Yeah, so, so what, this, what this whole panel has kind of alluded to is that every single person in here is capable. If you have a laptop, if you have a phone, you are all capable of doing the same stuff that we're doing on a daily basis. Yeah. The best so, camera is the one that you have with you, always. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Um, so we're short on time, so I want to get to the lightning round, and then we'll get to uh, oh. Q&A. Um, so uh, we'll have uh, microphones up, I believe. Uh, we'll see if that happens. But uh, <laughs> let's move on to the lightning round, where I'm going to spit out these questions as fast as I can, and we're going to get some good answers from these guys. So, and remember, when the, answer's been, when the uh, question's been answered, we're ringing the bell. So, first one, which company is your favorite in regards to the videos they create? I'm going off script. Oh, thank you. But I'm going off script. I, I like music video. I like music videos. That's how, where I find all my inspiration. Uh, a couple mm -hmm. of music video directors are the Daniels. Uh, they did the Turn Down For What music video. That probably launched their, their career. Uh, Hiro Murai, he does all Childish Gambino videos. Uh, and uh, Ninian and Doff, those are amazing video directors. I check out videostatic.com. They like aggregate all new music videos. That's how I get inspired. Okay. So I didn't, I didn't answer the question, though. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. That's, that's good. I mean, we're trying to give people an idea of where to go so that they can see videos to inspire how they want, might want to approach the feelings that they get from those videos. So are there any other companies that you guys love that do that? There's, um, as far as like a style where, and I think anyone can really do, and this one person has really mastered that. It's not, he is basically his own company as a brand, but Casey Neistat, has it built his brand on just like creating very human videos of himself and his family. And he's, he's a vlogger, he wasn't always a vlogger, he's a filmmaker, but he makes videos for brands and he creates it in such a way where you actually care about it. And he, he does it with a DSLR camera. I mean, there's no crazy cameras in his toolkit that anybody here could not get tomorrow. Um, and I, if, if I were to, uh, like an aspiring um, you know, filmmaker now, I would learn a lot from him. And I, I still, I do, actually, you know, just, just from the mindset. Yeah. yeah. Cool. It's been answered. It's been answered. Go ahead and answer. <laughs> okay, uh, so next question. Is the effectiveness of a video related to the price tag of your gear? And I should hear the same answer from every single one of you, so you better get it right. No. No. Yeah. Okay, let's ring the bell. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's an advantage of using video for internal communications versus emails, memos, et cetera? I think that the, my example of Next TV really nails that one. Internal video versus just sending out a newsletter internally is so, so much more, like it's, just, it's un incomparable how much uh, of a difference that would be uh, versus sending text. Um, you get to see face-to-face -face interactions with people, and that, I feel, is the most important thing. I think internal video is, uh, f is fertile proving grounds, too. It's like a great way for you to be testing out new concepts um, in an extremely low-risk way. Like if a video, if you, if you try to maybe integrate some comedy into one of your videos, instead of putting that on your front page, you send it out internally, and, and you can kind of proof out some new techniques, and if it fails, so what? You keep it internal. Not a big deal. Mm -hmm. But it is helpful for, I mean, we record every all hands meeting, so very practically, video is an incredible way to just scale communication. So if somebody missed an all hands meeting and they weren't on Zoom uh, to, to tune in to the live stream, we have a record of all those things because we use video. Not very sexy, but it's still very effective. Right? All right, you, you earned the bell. So for e for oh, oh we got one more yeah maybe so for email for internal for external it's the same it's to um, to gain attention to inspire to uh, why does anyone sh upload anything to YouTube Facebook or whatever it's to share an experience so if there's something meaningful there that taps into the emotions then sharing an experience uh, great yeah. phrase for this. Three, two, one. <laughs> Damn it. Ah, we'll get it better. <laughs> All right, up next. Is the audience more forgiving of low quality video or low quality audio? They're more forgiving of uh, low quality video, I think. Yeah. You, could, you could shoot a video on a potato and still have amazing audio and people will listen to it. I mean, I mean it's just the, a fact. You, you could have the worst audio and the best video and people are gonna be like, I can't watch this. Like, what am I watching? 
Well, yeah, a perfect example is if we're sitting up here and you could see our lips moving, but you couldn't, couldn't hear what we were saying. I mean, right. I mean, like if you were like watching a Charlie Chaplin movie, like that's different because it's meant to be like, like a physical like storytelling with title cards. Well, and they were different times too. <laughs> right, uh, for I, sure. I don't know, yeah. we're, uh, so like, yeah. I, I agree with I you guys 100%, but like we're actually reverting back to Charlie Chaplin. Yeah, no, we are. I think it's all about the channel in which your video is being consumed. If somebody's on your website and they click play on a, on a, on a video, your audio better sound good. 100%. But if they're scrolling through Facebook while they're you know, indisposed or whatever, um, they're probably not gonna have sound on. So we're back to Charlie Chapman yeah, we are. with Facebook right. video. So um, yeah, I think it's just something to consider where your video is being consumed. The correct answer the is yeah. both, <laughs> none, one or the other. There you go. <laughs> because they'll forgive anything. If, if it's not original, if it's not authentic, uh, that is hard to forgive. If it's 100% original, 100% authentic, bad quality video, bad quality audio, both are fine. All right, All right. let's get a bell. Three, two, one. Oh. Uh, that was mine. We'll right. get it. Yeah, all, right. <laughs> all right, last question before we go to Q&A. Are there any types of video that often get plagued with low engagement? I think the old uh, five minute explainer video on your front page. 100%. Where the, you know, your boss is telling you or your, your marketing person is telling you, you know, we gotta, we gotta tell, tell them everything about the product. Yep. Like now is our chance. Um, you know, we have, we have some data that we've, we have thousands and thousands of videos that we have access to the data on at Wistia and um, the, the, we're t attention sp our attention spans are terrible. There are probably people leaving as we speak right now because I'm blabbering on. But um, I think it's all about respecting people's time, uh, respecting your viewers' time. One minute video average is about 70% engagement. So they're watching 70% of that video. If it goes to four minutes, it drops down to around 50%. So um, you're, there's 50% of your video's message is not being consumed if your video is too long. Is that trending down too? Probably, we, yeah. I, that's a great question. I'll get the, the nerds in their nerdery to, to pull the data on that. I mean, I've seen but, idiocracy. Is, yeah, is, right. that, is that where we're going? <laughs> it's probably, we're close. I mean, yeah. we're not gonna, we're not gonna get, <laughs> go there. But I, I also think it depends on the type of video though, because if you could, you could have a 20 minute video, but as long as it's so, like they're learning something and they're getting value out of it, then it should be 20 minutes, you know? I mean, make the video for how long it should be, you know? I mean, like a 20 minute about my company video is gonna suck, but a 20 minute a video on how to use complex algorithms on how to do something, it just like, it's something that needs more time should have more time. And it's also very selective on the audience. Short stuff is very easy to digest across a wide audience, whereas, the longer stuff, as long as you got the right audience behind it, right. they'll watch the whole thing. Mm. Totally. You know? So that wraps up the lightning round. If we can get a final bell, Three, and two, we'll move on one. to Q&A. <laughs> uh, I, I yeah, in. I guess the first one. Okay. Uh, my question is, should every video have like a call to action on it? Are you videoing this right now? Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so should every uh, video have a call to action on it? I think it depends on what kind of video you're doing. I mean, you, I don't know if you'd want a call to action. I don't think so, yeah. For certain, I mean, like a call to, like a sales video for sure should, but like a call to action, I guess it depends on the call to action too, you know? I mean, if you want, like a call to action could be at the end of an instructional video could be like, if you want to learn more, click here. I mean. So perhaps not a call to action, but instead thinking the end of the video is not the end of the experience. Okay. Mm. Yeah, that that's can, a great. Wait, wait. If that can help. Can I ask one more question while I have the mic? Go for it. So uh, I'm not afraid of speaking in front of people or whatever, but you put a phone or a camera in front of me and I become an idiot. So is there any <laughs> advice on kind of getting over that stage fright? Just keep doing it. I would, this is something I'm very passionate about is making sure that like whenever I'm making a video that I'm capturing their true authentic self. So our mantra at Wistia is to just get loose just, sh just like shake it out a little bit, literally like shake your arms and try to remember that the video is going to be edited, that um, 
it, you know, that you have a, a ton of tries that you can do. You can do multiple takes. It's not Dateline. You're not getting grilled. It should be fun. And trying to flip the, the whole script on making a video to be like, oh my God, what if I look stupid? What if I sound stupid? To be like, no, this should be fun. Um, trying to keep the environment as light as possible in the room. Um, and, but literally just shaking things out and like moving yourself around, that gets your energy up and kind of gets you out of your, your own head. I also think that's a perk to having an in-house video guy too because they can make the person feel more comfortable as well. Or a strong tequila. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here. Oh, uh, yeah. what's okay. A so is it me? Uh, yeah. Wonderful. Oh. So uh, I have actually two questions. The first one is that if you, for example, uh, doing mass production of videos. And you have to kind of figure out how you can uh, go for uh, operation efficiency versus creativity and authenticity, you know, as, as Chris said. So it, it looks authentic somehow. How, how can you figure out which, you know, between these two? where to go, so you know, fun, be, being function. efficient and at the same time looking creative and uh, uh, authentic. So function versus cost interesting, actually. creative, artsy, that, yeah, cost that, and, that yeah. dynamic? Okay, yeah, creative well, let's have some side. thoughts on that. I think, uh, I think that, uh, sorry, I can barely see you, but hi. Uh, <laughs> I think introducing some constraints to your video process can help you become more efficient. Um, one constraint that we use at Wistia is a lot of our videos are shot in our studio, which is just four walls that have a door that close. But uh, we set up um, a, a solid color background. It's a piece of uh, paper. Seam it's called seamless photo paper. And um, we keep our studio set up in there. And we have a camera with an X for where the tripod goes. We have two Xs where the lights go. And basically, a lot of our videos, the narrative part of our videos, um, are filmed in that studio. So um, it kind of, it's a constraint where it takes all of the, like you could shoot a video in a million different locations, um, but for most of our videos, one constraint we have is, you know, this video is gonna get shot, the narrative talking head part of it is gonna get shot in the same place, using the same gear, and is it's it always set up. Is it scripted for everything that you shoot? I'm sorry? Is it scripted? scripted. Um, we shoot mostly everything uh, scripted, yep. Uh, and that is another way to be efficient because you can prove out the script and make sure that um, everyone is aligned on the message and then um, it's just a matter of getting those script readings as natural and human as possible. And that way you're not wasting time, you get halfway through and you're like, oh, all that other stuff doesn't even work. You plan it out ahead of time and you save yourself so much more time in the, in the end. Yeah, but by following this model, you're removing about 50 different decisions and choices and variables that you don't have to deal with, you don't have to do. You know exactly, you can get right to the content, to the script, and to the creation, which I think is really, really helpful. Okay, thanks. Who's next? Okay. I have a uh, two-part question for each of you. Um, if I'm building an in-house video team and money was no object, what computer would you purchase for them? And okay. what two programs would you run to do your video editing? What's the so, second part? So the, what the two programs. programs would you use to do your video editing? What are your two favorite? All right, so what kind of computer? Would you like to know more hardware? Uh, okay, so what, what, what kind of computer? Maybe a simple setup for getting started right off the bat. And I'm sorry, the second question. And soft software? software. Money, money software. Money's no object for two the apps. computer. Yeah. Uh, what do you guys edit on? Final Cut or Premiere? Well, no, we're in Premiere, yeah. So Premiere Pro, which is an Adobe, it's within the Adobe suite. Um, it's awesome. I mean, it's, it's not perfect, but it's, uh, it's continually updated and it, uh, with, with the new cameras that come out, it stays up to date with all that. Um, we use Premiere, I think it's great. Um, and then we work on a, uh, IMAX with a RAID hard drive that can hold all of our data that we continually, RAID is basically, if you're not familiar, just a bunch of different hard drives that are connected to be able to work faster and it also is redundant so if one of the, fa the drives fails, you don't lose all of your information, so. I, I personally uh, like working off a laptop. Um, I just bit my tongue and bought the new MacBook Pro <laughs> with all of its 
lack of ports, which I'm, is driving me crazy, but I bought it because I need the fastest laptop possible. My reasoning for ed wanting to edit on a laptop is because I need to be able to make changes wherever I am. Like if, I, like this morning, I had to put a new um, edit on a video that's launching tomorrow, and if I had had that on an iMac at home or whatever, I would have been screwed and we would have had to delay the launch. So I like personally editing off a laptop. You do have a little bit of a speed compromise, which is why I bought the new one. I would just say to buy as big of a um, hard drive as you can afford. Uh, and if it's SSD like the new MacBook Pros, you'll be able to edit 4K internally. Um, and uh, basically our workflow is we edit internally on a laptop, get the video out. Once it launches, then um, I free up space on the laptop and move it to an archival like a, a, a RAID situation. But I would definitely say Premiere and the fastest laptop you can afford. So Ryan, what do you do for music creation? What are you on? Uh, for music creation, I mean, there's two music creation platforms um, that are, are widely used, Logic, uh, which is basically an Apple uh, app, and Pro Tools. Um, but I think on this level, like, I think that's probably going too deep. Um, if, mm -hmm. it, you know, basically, I would find the music you want to use and bring it into whatever your native uh, film editing app, whether it's Premiere, Final Cut Pro, or something else. Yeah. Uh, for the most part, I think everybody yeah. up here is Mac versus PC. Yeah, but the nice thing about Premiere is that it, it runs on both platforms as opposed to getting, like teaching yourself Final Cut Pro, uh, that's Apple only. So if you did want to, like a lot of filmmakers are thinking about jumping ship back to PC, which is not actually going to happen, but um, <laughs> no offense, Microsoft, you're out there. Um, but yeah, that is a nice thing that Premiere is cross-functional yeah. platform. Yeah. Yeah. What do you edit on? Yeah, I'll second Premiere, but uh, ultimately it depends who you hire, because they might prefer Final Cut. Uh, but yeah, definitely Mac. Um, and again, the laptop versus desktop totally depends on the type of video. Uh, maybe After Effects as well, depends. Like maybe yep. they're doing I'll motion just go graphics. for the Creative Cloud. Yeah, just... Adobe Creative Cloud, yep. Yeah. Okay, so Mac and the Creative Cloud, that's, there it is. That's all you need. Are you gonna do it? Are you gonna build uh, something like that? Okay, perfect. Yes. Uh, where's our next question? Hi, um, I'm Stacey Mallet. I'm with Video Loco. So I appreciate the session. Equally passionate about video, and we're a video production company for those that can't hire in-house. We work with our clients through a transparent process at all costs and levels. So cool. um, the question that we work through with clients today that's probably the most challenging is to get to, as many of you said, their authentic story and their authentic self. What is the question that you ask someone that's in front of you for an internal video or externally that you feel draws out that authentic story and the authentic self of that person for the video? I don't think there's a specific question. There isn't like a, just like the magic bullet of the questions. I think it's more about how you prep them ahead of time. Um, if, if you're, if what I do, if I'm going to do a testimonial with somebody, um, and I need to be able to get that authentic reaction. I'll do a, a video call with them ahead of time, so that way when I get there, they know my face, and we've actually met. And then that way, they're already right there, com comfortable with me. And it's all about, really, I think, the direction behind the camera. Even if you've never met them before, it's all about you making them feel comfortable uh, to get that authentic reaction. Yeah, uh, for me, it's, it's all about controlling the environment that you're shooting in. Um, as the director of a video, which is also often you're also the camera person as well, um, you need to make sure your, your environment, your shooting environment is as light and supportive as possible. So um, I, I can talk until I'm blue in the face about this. We, we have a post about it on, on our blog too. It's called Working with Non-Actors, but basically um, like kicking people out of the room, making sure the person that's on camera's boss isn't in there, um, make sure there's nobody you know, like on their cell phones like needlessly, um, keeping the gear to a minimum as possible. Um, that influences a lot of our lighting decisions. Like yeah, I could probably blow out uh, the, a lighting rig and make somebody look absolutely incredible, but like I'd rather ha keep the lighting to a minimum, make it easier on the talent so that we're not th doing this like we're doing right now, like I can't even see anything out there. 
Um, so I'd rather sacrifice a tiny bit of lighting quality to make sure that the environment is unintimidating. And that's how you're going to get the authentic reaction is if people forget all about that there's a camera uh, in, the, in their face. I, I want to add to this question, actually, in that if you consider you know, if you were to describe all of our personalities just from this panel, I mean, you might have uh, somewhat a good idea as to what we're like uh, outside of, you know, presenting on stage, but if you were to describe your best friend to us, you would have a much more authentic picture of them because you've asked them tons of questions, you know their belief system, you know their strong suits, you know where they perhaps are not as strong, and so you avoid those areas, so really, uh, I, I like to stress that, you know, having, oh, just going off again. I, I like to stress that having a lot of open communication, getting to know the people that you're working with, whether they're in front of the camera or behind it, uh, having that, um, I guess that uh, rapport mm. with everyone yes. is vital to nailing that authenticity. Yes. And next question. We've got a couple on that side too. Oh, we got a couple on that side? A bunch, yeah. Um, in terms of like imagery and using like visionary art, um, like how important of a focus is that to you in creating films? Um, in terms I, I'm of, I'm sorry, a little bit louder. Um, how important is like imagery and visionary art in terms of you know creating um, video and helping people understand like really distant concepts and ideas? Like I look to Jason Silva, who's a performing philosopher and filmmaker and he uses a lot of visionary art because a lot of his ideas are very far out there. And I would even assume for like, um, you know, helping like a company understand like internal processes, like just spatial arrangement within certain videos and yeah. you know, stuff might help with that. So how often do you focus on that? Is that, or are you basically? Christian, I feel like you gotta have yeah. some, All right. some gold yeah. on this. I, yeah, I think that that's really important. Um, you can, associate objects to ideas. You can uh, make something really scary, uh, friendly, and familiar. Uh, I think that's what you mean. Through, so through imagery rather than like a, a talking head. Uh, there's a lot that, um, yeah, that you can do with that. I'll give you an example. Um, I did a piece for uh, one of the oldest companies in the world, Cambridge University Press and they wanted to launch um, a web app. And the last people to embrace uh, technology are teachers and doctors, apparently. So we made a video that showed everything that the platform did, but without one screenshot, without one person talking about it, just showing those objects, the same tools, the same methodology. It's just that it's on a digital platform. So yeah, Im imagery is uh, concepts, notions, ideas. Uh, yeah, but because if someone's going to explain that for you before you're gonna point the camera at them and start rolling, you need to get to that essence, the core essence of the idea that you want to communicate. May, may I elaborate a little? Um, so the way I see like the cinematic experience is being able to set a frame of reference, be able to transpose the identity of the person watching it. Um, and I know sometimes that frame of reference is a lot easier to connect to, you know, when you, you know, have a story, have that narrative, and you have an environment in which somebody's used to. So I guess I'm speaking to like post-editing where you put it, where there's just a ton of editing and people can't really connect with the environment that's there. Um, is that something you generally avoid, or is that something that you, you know, use so that you can connect distant ideas or concepts or um, help explain like a company's mission, that sort of thing? So, uh, yeah. just to tie this up, you're, lo you're looking for the uh, experience of the viewer and having them understand what you would like to communicate v visually. Speaking yeah. from a post end. Yeah, and in terms of creating, in terms of creating a video, would you rather um, have like shoot shoot the video in an environment that somebody is used to that they've seen before, like knowing that your audience has been I in see, an office okay. building, that kind of thing, like set, setting that frame of reference in that environment, as opposed to having you know 
somebody floating in like a new type of, you know, with like a green screen in the background and, you know, having that disconnect from what they're used to. It's a different reality. Does that make sense? Yeah, so basically how does familiarity of, effect, an, of yeah. a shooting environment affect the performance and the overall outcome yeah. for, for an actor and for the crew and everything? Uh, is that uh, more so for the attendee and like how the person who creates the video looks at it, what's going to make the most impact. I'm sorry, say that last part again. Um, more so looking to the video creator looking, or more so the video creator focus. It's all, it's all good. I, I, I'm going to just throw one out there. So like for us at Wistia, we're a software company. Our product it lives on people's computers, um, and our company works in a building. And we're not actors; we're real people. So I use all of those like, tr like true things, and um, that I use those as my visual like um, jumping off points for all of our videos. So I won't extrapolate the Wistia product into a series of illustrations to try to explain it. I will show people through video what the product actually looks like and try to craft the story to make sure I explain it. Um, I won't use green screen. Uh, I would rather shoot in front of either a solid background or shoot out in the wild, which is like out in the Wistia office to kind of show our viewers the backdrop, the true backdrop, trying to be our most authentic self and visually um, it's our opinion to that your visual should match that as well. Um, we have nothing. We have nothing to hide. We want to be ourselves, and we want to um, kind of show who we are. I think as long as the visuals support the end goal, and you're not just doing it just to be creative and confuse people, like it, it could end up confusing people if you don't. If if, if it has nothing to do, or is, is it's it's off base uh, from what the actual goal is. Uh, you're trying to get across is. So just think, I mean, always be thinking about what is the goal of this video and is this visual going to help get that point across? And get feedback too. Show it to one person. Ask them how they felt after it. If, if they're not answering what you would like them to answer, change it up. You know? Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, next question. Hi, my name is Queen Muhammad Ali. I'm a film director and multimedia activist. And I wanted to find out um, from all of you guys, um, being that you have like scripted uh, films or I'm sorry, commercials or video content, how do you navigate through the different social media mediums? Like Snapchat, they have time constraints, like 10 seconds or something. Do you all script out each like 10 seconds script out something for that, or 30 seconds for this, a minute for that. How do you all do that to I make it easy? Yeah, it's not necessarily script and more, with that specific example, it's not necessarily a script and it's more of an idea. Right. You know, okay, like, hey, the idea for this uh, Snapchat is that we want to show our really fun culture and we're having a crazy hat day. And so you just go and you, whatever, and for, for me, what we do is just like, if it feels right, in mm -hmm. that sense, then let's just do it, you know. Um, I, I mean, you could script out larger things. Larger things um, should be scripted out, but you should always have an idea. And then, like what I was saying right. before, as long as everything's meeting the goal, it doesn't really matter how you get there. Yeah, I would say that um, we, uh, we will create videos for each particular uh, platform. So we're not going to put the same video that we would put on, say, our, the learning area of our site. We wouldn't just copy and paste that and, 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 and upload that video to Facebook or to Twitter. Right, Instead, okay. what we're doing is, OK, we want to promote this piece of content that we just made um, uh, on Twitter. We know that Twitter's constraint is two minutes of video. Um, so we're going to use that constraint to make a Twitter video, and then we will make a Twitter video. And Facebook, okay, we know that Facebook doesn't have a time constraint, but people are super distracted, and um, there's no audio on most of these things. So we will make a video for Facebook that has a strong hook at the beginning and has hard-coded text overlaid, 
that points back to another piece of content. So it, it, the video strategy has to be a, like considering how your viewers are watching your content. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And so that's, yeah. that's going to influence how we make and script those that videos. That makes sense. I was really just trying to figure out, was there a shortcut? Because we're like going crazy making videos for each, you know, thing. And sometimes it just <laughs> gets I mean, the crazy. It, it's not easy you know like yeah. it, it, like <laughs> know. it really it, it, that's I think that's the only way to put it like you have to if you want it to be effective you have to be willing to put in the time to make it that way you're true you know yeah. and that's I mean there's there's no like I said before there's no magic bullet you just you, have to yeah you could just like t send the same video to all the different platforms but you're just not you're missing an opportunity there true. but it, it like if you're super strapped then just do that it's still like you're still like kind of using the fact that hopefully visually you can still hook some of these viewers even if you're just copying and pasting the same video. Yeah, well, thanks. Okay. Hi, how you doing? Um, my question, if I'm just bringing us back to a tech question, um, we spoke a little about production um, and you know production platforms. If we can maybe just address um, hosting YouTube versus Vimeo versus self, uh, and whether it's going to be email or whether it's going to be website. Obviously, the Wistia guy probably shouldn't uh, partake in this, but, the, um, wow. but I'm, I'm happy to have your input too. And as far as file size, um, you know, frames per second, uh, if we can just try to address that, and what are some of your recommendations on the delivery side of video? Sure. I'll I'll try this one, and I'm a little bit more of a, a novice in the video production. Um, but I would say um, it, it depends on wh what are you trying to accomplish, you know, channel versus channel, or, or, or hosting service versus hosting service. Because um, I think there's, there's different pros and cons to all of them. You know, if we're simply hosting um, content on our website at marmosetmusic.com, we want to measure the uh, performance and the analytics and, and basically get the function um, and performance that we want. You know, we're going we're gonna to base our selection on a hosting company um, on that. Um, and in our case, we use Wistia. However, there are different audiences that tend to be, uh, that tend to be more tuned into different channels. There's different audiences on YouTube than, than, than Vimeo, than uh, well, Snapchat or Facebook or anything else. And so knowing your audience and what you're trying to achieve, what, where you're posting or hosting that video is really important. So. Um, Anybody else want to take that no, I completely agree on that, yeah. Um, like, with YouTube, I would think it's more for, like, building your, like, brand awareness, like, to just uh, organic search. And if you want something to go viral, probably won't, but, uh, you know, that would be where it would happen. Um, if you want people to be able to search for your video, that would be where you'd want to put it. If you're an artist and you want people to find your art, um, then you put that on Vimeo. I mean, that's where people go, they're, they're looking for it. You know, you're not gonna learn how to cook in a, in a dictionary. You know, you have to figure out what's the right place to go. I, I will say, I'm gonna say something anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna talk about Wistia either, uh, but you should be, if you're, if you're, if you wanna put Facebook, if you wanna put a video on Facebook, you should be using Facebook video. If you wanna put a, t a video on Twitter, you should be using Twitter native. Like, be using the native video platforms. Yeah. It seems obvious, but like copy, cop, uh, pasting a YouTube link onto Facebook, like Facebook is a walled garden, so Facebook wants Facebook videos to be seen in Facebook. They don't want other videos to be seen in Facebook because it takes you out of the context of Facebook. So you gotta use that um, to, your, to your advantage. Right. Yeah, that, that's a huge point, knowing, knowing the platform as well as the audience. And frames per second, file size, those kinds of things? You know, we could honestly talk forever on file size and uh, all the different workflow methods. I, really, you know, the, you, most of the programs that we've talked about have built-in settings that will spit out exactly what you need depending on the platform. A lot of them are even named like YouTube, high bitrate. You know, and you know that you're getting a high quality video that's capable of being put on YouTube. Uh, and plus, most of these platforms are able to take whatever you throw at them. So it's really a matter of, you know, how much investment do you want to put into your uh, storage infrastructure that would determine how, you know, how the, the quality that you want to 
export everything and keep all your data and all that. Uh, but the, I mean, all these platforms are very good at dancing around whatever you throw them. Um, so I think we actually have time for only one more question, if we have it. Hi. Um. Oh, I've been <laughs> oh, waiting. We got, we got let's, time for let's two. Do, let's do two. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll do two. <laughs> Uh, you, you, any, everybody can come to us afterwards and we will be happy to answer any questions. All these guys are more than capable to answer whatever questions you, you have. So let's grab these last two and then find us after the show. We'd love to talk to everybody. Okay, I'm gonna lighten it up because I'm a 55 year old woman and I'm trying to start a consulting business and uh, all this tech stuff is cool. I know you guys are cool guys and everything, but I'm 55 trying to start a business and I want to be the Chewbacca lady of real estate consulting. So how do, have any of you ever had a, a video go viral? And did that viral video bring you clients? Um, and is that something that I think to myself, I want this to go viral? Or it just happens because I did something silly? I mean, so what can I do to, what, what would be the first thing I would do to, at least for my first video, to get it out there? I mean, it's not that I haven't done others, but they've been mostly instructional type stuff, and I, th I think it's time to break out of the box a little, so. I don't think you should ever really try to go viral. Um, it just happens, and the ones that do go viral um, are viral because it's in the right place at the right time. Uh, you know, I mean, Chewbacca Lady was a big hit because not only was her personality just like amazing, but Star Wars was coming out, and everybody loves Chewbacca, and she was hilarious, and that, that was just perfect. Um, so it's, it's about like the current state of the world and um, what, their, what their entertainment is at that time. What are they looking for? You know, and it's, there's no, like I feel like I said it a bunch of times, there's no silver bullet for this, like there's no magic that just happens. You can't press a button. Yeah. Uh, I would say the first thing you should do is not try to go viral, and I would try to say try to go helpful. Uh, I know you said you don't want to do the helpful approach because that's played out, but I do think that if you if you focus your efforts more on helping um, solve a problem or helping differentiate yourself or helping um, people introduce yourself or helping be uh, a thought leader on something, um, that's an easier, more attainable goal. Um, I would focus your effort on that. Uh, rather than trying to make a flashbang success, because um, that's that's the like basically we refer to those videos as hardworking videos, like making a video, putting the effort into something that is going to work for you, like definitely going to work for you, even if it's like on a person by person basis. That's that slow burn, that slow fire burns the hard hottest. Hi, um, I've been making videos for years. Um, and uh, I do it for, uh, as part of my job for my school and on my own. Um, I have two quick questions. Um, the first one quicker than the second. Um, is 4K, do you use it in your work at all yet? Or do you, do you even bother with 4K or any higher resolutions than 1080? I just do 1080, so I was wondering what your take out was on 4K this day and age. Depends on the end product, where it's gonna be shown, that number one, I think. And then number two, uh, 4K you can crop in and you're able to, um, you know, say you only have one camera. If you shoot in 4K, so this, you know, it's this big. Uh, but you want to do, you want to be able to make cuts on an interview without making it jumpy. Then you can crop in within a 1080 timeline. I know that we're getting kind of technical, but uh, you know, keep it in a 1080 timeline, but shoot in 4K, and then you're able to crop in double basically without losing any resolution. And you can use that one camera as two cameras without without an additional one, yeah. Those would be my two points, I don't know if you guys. Uh, I might add to that actually. Yeah. Uh, if you consider all the cameras out right now, these things are titans. They all produce, yeah. whether it's 1080 or 4K or 8K or whatever, every single one of these cameras out now, they'll produce a beautiful image. What's important is having that image be lit well and he hearing good sound. I mean, when do you not watch a video because it wasn't shot in 4K? Yeah, right. You know? So ask yourself that question, uh, you know, next time you see a video, did I, do I care that this is in 4K or not? And if not, perhaps it's not as big a deal to the, the viewer. You the know? odds are it's not going to be shown on a 4K monitor. I right. mean, the, the amount of people that have 4K monitors is very low. Mm -hmm. 
And if you're doing a presentation and you're being, having it projected on a 4K uh, projector, then great, shoot in 4K. But really, I think it's all, I mean, if it's gonna be on the web and you're not gonna be using any like cropping in or like stabilization or anything like that, then just shoot in 1080. I mean, like there's no difference really. There really, there really isn't. Yeah, those are some good points, thank you. Um, the other question is, um, as you may all be aware, I don't know if you use them in any of your professional videos, like for your work, um, but intros, they obviously can be very long and annoying and you will quit the video like on YouTube before you ever watch the rest of the video. Still will be short, I mean it's essential for branding some, in some cases and making an identity and growing a following. But do you use them at all? What do, what do you think on intros? Um, I, don't, I don't use them. Uh, because <laughs> the engagement usually will, it, like your, every second is precious, especially no. at the head of your video. So it's like you're just making yourself feel good about your brand, no. in my opinion. There are a lot of people, that, it's, it's a very subjective thing though. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we don't even have, we care so much about engagement that we don't even have a little, we used to have a little ending animation, like a little slick, like the Wistia logo animates and then it pops out. I just throw the logo right up at the top, at the end of the video, like hard cut, and then end that video as quickly as possible so I can get to a CTA if I have at the end of the video right. because if you have this fancy outro, there, you're going to, you're 100% going to be missing people that make it to the bitter end of your video. Mm -hmm. But it is subjective, I think. No. Yeah. Okay. One thing you could do in the intro versus having like a big fancy logo pop in is just, if it's on, if it's for web, just be like, hey, you know, in this video you're going to be learning how to do this, this, and this, boom, and then go straight into it. Oh, the hook, the, the hook, hook intro. Yeah. That way yeah. people know what they're going to get. If that's not what they want, then they're going to leave. If that's what they want, that's they'll stay good. to the end, you know. I like that. Well, I think that's all the time we have. So please give it up for our panelists. Thank you. Very smart guys.